Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the University of the Philippines and the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation's webinar series on Stop COVID Deaths, Clinical Management Updates on How to Manage uh, COVID-19 Cases in the Philippines and discussing the state of the art in terms of infectious disease uh, management, uh, re renal management, cardiology management, and other specialties. Uh, good afternoon. I am Dr. Raymond Francis Sarmiento from the National Telehealth Center of the National Institutes of Health, University of the Philippines, Manila. And this is the sixth webinar in our series. And together with me, as always, uh, in our Friday lunch date, is my mentor and board member of PhilHealth, Dr. Susie Mercado. Dr. Susie? Hi, good afternoon, uh, Raymond, at sa lahat ng mga sumama sa atin ngayon. Uh, mukhang maraming masyadong nag-register ngayong Raymond mo. Uh, I'd like to, I'd just like to welcome everyone to the webinar. Those of you who are watching on PVUP and those of you who are watching on, on the playback. We have a lot of uh, seasoned clinicians who listen to this webinar. At marami rin yung mga bagets, hindi bagets ang word, mga, tama ba yan, Raymond, mga millennials who are, who are watching. And um, this is, as Raymond said, the sixth in a series of, uh, of our, uh, what should I say, our efforts to try to bring the latest knowledge, um, information on management of COVID in the country to everyone. So we have people watching from all over the country, also from other outside of the country. So this is just a welcome and um, Friday is always exciting because of these clinical management updates. Thank you, Dr. Susie. And of course, this webinar series will not be possible without the uh, total team effort po, uh, from the University of the Philippines, uh, the Office of the President, uh, represented herein by Executive Vice President, Dr. Teodoro Herbosa, from the Office of the Vice President for Public Affairs, uh, Dr. Elena Pernia, uh, from TVUP, uh, which is our official, shall we say, uh, conduit, of, uh, and then for, for bringing this to the public po and represented herein by uh, Dr. Gigi Alfonso. We also have our IT support group from UP and I ITDC and also from UP Manila, uh, the National Telehealth Center of the, uh, the National Institutes of Health. And from the field health side, obviously, uh, Dr. Susie Mercado's board member represents uh, the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation. Today, we are very privileged po uh, to have uh, so we say a very special message from our opening remarks speaker and I will give the floor to Dr. Susie for that a short introduction of our uh, opening remarks speaker. Okay, thanks Raymond. So as you all know, this is a joint effort of the University of the Philippines and the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation. I think PLL is really doing its best trying now to reach out and not just be a financer of the healthcare services, but also an enabler and a facilitator for dialogue among uh, practitioners. So it's my privilege to introduce the uh, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation, uh, Brigadier General Ricardo Morales. Hi, good afternoon everyone. Maraming salamat sa pag-participate dito sa web seminar na tumutugon sa mga responde natin sa kabutihan ng ating mga health workers. In a way, itong COVID-19 pandemic has uh, it's going to impact our lives in ways that we still do not know. Sabi nga nila, we still do not know what we do not know. So this effort is an attempt to shine a light into the dark room that is uh, COVID-19. Uh, if it's any consolation, uh, PhilHealth will uh, shoulder at cost the health uh, requirements, the cost of treatment of all healthcare workers during the pandemic. This includes uh, all uh, personnel who are required uh, to serve in the operation of a health facility. So, uh, as I said, uh, we still do not know what we do not know, but nobody knows everything. But there is something that somebody knows that if we exchange this information, we share this information, it will increase our knowledge at uh, it will make us uh, respond to the uh, emergency much better. So this is the purpose of this uh, web seminar, to uh, increase our knowledge by exchanging information with each other, sharing, 
and hopefully reach a synthesis. Uh, you know, sabi nga nila, one plus one is not two, but, uh, you know, something more, maybe three, four. So it depends on the uh, dynamics. And I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Susie uh, Mercado for her initiative in this effort. She is a board member of our PhilHealth. And Dr. Antonio Ramos for uh, agreeing to be the uh, facilitator of this activity. So again, uh, from PhilHealth, serving 108 million Filipinos. Uh, thank you very much for participating in this activity and we look forward to more engagements in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Maraming salamat po for that uh, wonderful message from our PhilHealth President and CEO, Brigadier, Retired Brigadier General Ricardo Morales po. No? Uh, susugan ko lang po yung sinabi ni uh, CEO Morales po na this webinar series provides an avenue for our top clinicians to be able to provide state-of-the-art information po on how to manage COVID-19 cases. And we are very lucky and privileged to be able to provide this channel uh, to our to the public and also to our frontline workers who are at, at each step of the way and every day is fighting the COVID-19 fight. So uh, before we proceed, I think this is the time when we, before we introduce our guest speaker, resource person, this is the time that we go ahead with our traditional ona pre-webinar questions. Very, very simple lang po ang ating pre-webinar questions that was given by our resource person. So sana po ay uh, uh, inaanyayahan po namin po kayo lahat na sagutin po ito. Our first question, it reads, which is more important, patient care or personal safety? So as the, as the answers are trickling in po, no? nearly 90% of uh, respondents they selected option B, which is personal safety, as opposed to option A, patient care. So, mamaya po, uh, our resource speaker will provide the correct answers po, ano po, uh, for, to these pre-webinar questions. And then, moving on to question number two, does personal safety end when you leave the hospital? Hanggang sa hospital lang po ba talagang binabantayan ang personal safety? So, well, nearly 99% of our attendees po, no? They answered uh, no. Uh, so, hindi po ito tumitigil dun po sa, let's say, sa, sa hangganan uh, or boundaries po ng hospital. So, uh, later on, uh, we will be asking our resource speaker uh, to provide the correct answers. And uh, I will give the floor again to Dr. Susie Mercado to provide the uh, brief introductions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Raymond. So in our um, in our uh, informational material on this meeting, uh, you know, we quoted some data from the Department of Health in in late April that more than a thousand healthcare workers have been infected by COVID. Four hundred twenty-two of them, about half, were doctors. Three hundred eighty-six nurses, and so on. And uh, in in late April, we had nineteen deaths of doctors. So I think this has been really a very tragic season for us in the healthcare, in the healthcare world. But um, there's always hope. I think um, part of our clinical webinar is really to move forward, to charge on. And it's really uh, an honor and a privilege for me to introduce our next speaker. He said he wanted me to keep the, the introduction short, which is difficult because he's highly accomplished, but so I'll make it short. I mean, I've known our speaker for more than 24 years um, in a time when we didn't know if we were going to become doctors. And even then when I knew him in college, he was already a leader. And I'm not surprised that he's leading the charge here on, uh, you know, keeping our health workers safe. You've seen him on media. Uh, he ha always has a lot to say about the safety of healthcare workers. And I think that is something that's fundamental to uh, controlling the transmission of COVID and keeping the whole country safe. So, it's my pleasure to introduce um, the manager of the Department of Administrative Services of the Lung Center of the Philippines, which is the premier institution for uh, lung, lung disease in our country. He's a surgeon and a dear friend and a champion advocate, uh, and I would say a public servant, a true public servant who's always looking out for, for people, even if... Um, what should I say? The, the going gets rough. Marami pa ang gusto sabihin eh, pero mamaya na lang. 
Anyway, my pleasure. Dr. Antonio Ramos. Tony, welcome to the webinar. Hi, Susie. Long time no see. Eh? At okay. least we see each other online. Good afternoon to everyone. Fran Raymond, finally I saw you. Yes, sir. So, Tony, I heard somewhere that you use 300 to 500 PPEs per day in the lung center. Is that correct? Yeah. Right now, I asked yesterday. Uh, it's closer to 500 than 300 because we have more critically ill patients now. And so the use is really high. And uh, we do not scrimp on PPEs. Then right. That's one way that we can really protect our personnel. So what, what do you think now that we're going into GCQ? Mukabang, ano? Uh, what does it look like for you? Well, uh, for the past few days, the numbers have been going up as far as admissions are concerned, but that's just us. We don't know if it's because people prefer to go to lung center. The triage numbers are going up also, and maybe for the same reason. But uh, we've always been thinking that when the quarantine levels go down, we should be even more careful and we should be prepared, more even prepared. That is why if we're asked if we still need more PPEs, the answer is always yes. We still need more. We're still stuck, stockpiling on these things and uh, other things that we need like uh, ventilators, air conditioning units. Because uh, we will only stop when we know that despite the relaxation of quarantine, there, there is really a flattening of the numbers. Okay, so big challenge ahead. So Tony, please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, Susie. First, I'd like to thank... Uh, I'd like to thank the University of the Philippines, of course, National Telehealth Center, the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation, and you, Susie, for you know, putting me up to this. Um, <laughs> Basically, it is sharing of uh, the lung center experience. I don't want to call it best practice because uh, I'm sure we all have, as uh, general, the general said, we all know something better than the other people. And I just want to share our experience. And I hope during the open forum, we can also learn from, from the others. Well, I'd just like to share our experience. <laughs> and uh, yeah. when I'm, I'm asked, is this best practice? I say, no, this is lung center practice and would like to learn from others. This is a picture of lung center. It looks clean and nice, but this is pre-COVID. And as I mentioned earlier, we're the referral center for COVID-19 and uh, we concentrate on moderate to severe respiratory disease. It's just like Philippine General Hospital. And uh, I was talking about this earlier. We were thinking what would be our priorities our objectives are patient care and personal safety, but it, it, it really was a very long discussion and uh, very vigorous discussion. And uh, personal safety won out and thankfully so. And so when we decided that personal safety was going to be number one, it was the basis of all our decisions later on. And very important that you are not confused. The outline is, I will tell you about the incident command system, safety officer and zoning, infrastructure modifications, equipment that we have, the supplies that we, that we, that we have right now, and then the care for our personnel. Now, this is how an incident command structure looks like. Uh, you have an incident commander, and then you have four sections, operations, planning, logistics, and finance. Um, this is the clean one. But after it was populated, you can see that you have an incident commander. The incident commander is Vincent Balanag, is the director. I'm the assistant uh, incident commander. We have a public information officer, safety officer, liaison. And under operations, you have everything. You have, I'll tell you about these task forces, strike teams, and uh, single resources. And then the next section is planning. Resources are planned here. Then you have the demobilization when everything is over and done with, or we change a different uh, quarantine level. Then we have the, the demobilization. And of course, documentation, very important. Being, so we should be able to say what we did and put it into a playbook so that hopefully not, but if it happens again, we can just bring the playbook out and, and you know, we can, uh, we can redo it. And then finally, finance and administration, which is still also mine. It talks about uh, HR, it talks about uh, 
HR, it talks about costing, it talks about the business side of things. Now this is how the incident post looks like. I'll, I'll, I'm sorry, I'll just... This is how the incident uh, post looks like. If you notice, it's situated outside of the hospital because as, as uh, our CEO, Phil CEO said, we don't know everything about everything. We don't know how, we didn't know how the virus is going to be transmitted. So to play it safe, all key personnel are members of the incident command system. I decided let's put it outside. So in case somebody, you know, it's so hard to contaminate us. Because if somebody in the incident command gets sick, and just imagine who's going around the hospital. The three whiteboards you see on, in the front, one is the structure, the one in the middle would be the daily briefings. I'll show you this to you later. And the left would be the surge planning. You can see the seats are a little about uh, one meter apart and hopefully this is enough for social distancing. And you have to put on electric fans too. Wow, the, the heat is too much. And this is how the briefing goes. Um, either myself or Vince does the, does the presiding. Uh, the one at the lower bottom, on the right lower bottom is uh, initially when we, we have the meeting. And uh, the briefing is just what it is really. It's just a briefing. You can share the numbers. Please don't, uh, don't copy this so much because these are the crucial information. This is how we started. So we have sections for beds. We have sections for triage, section of ventilator use. I'm talking from the right. And then the different task forces. Engineering support, very important for the different task forces. And then uh, we have the hotline with the COVID lab reports. How many days COVID negative at that point? April 20 something, it's two days. And then task force personnel, shelter vacancies. And then the Facebook page, you have to put up the lab and lung. This is how it looks like now. It's neat, right? Uh, over the weekend, we tried to clean it. But you can see very clearly that we are on our nine days. When we say nine days, nine days since we had the positive personnel. Our highest was 30, now it's nine. But unfortunately today, this morning, we had one asymptomatic personnel who tested positive, so we're back to zero. We have a running total of patients that we saw. I'm talking from the right, okay? We're moving to the left. And then the different wards, you can see how many positives we have, how many probables, total, how many are intubated, how many vacancies, and what's the total capacity. You can see we have 88, and we have a total of 15 vacancies in the COVID wards. And in the non-COVIDs, we have 35 and uh, three intubated. So we already know at, at, in the morning how many are intubated, how many admitted, how many ventilators we need, how many seen at the triage, non-COVID and COVID, how many were admitted, how many mortalities, and then for the task forces, if you go back, we go to the middle now, you have the medical task force, they have their action plans, the plan for resurgence, plan for demobilization. We're doing OPD planning now, doctor's clinics, and return of uh, diagnostic services. Always at the bottom, engineering support, very important. Same with the triage. What we're working now would be the shelter for the relatives and the guards because we have to reconfigure the grounds. On the left, we have the COVID laboratory and the gene expert lab. They have separate numbers. And then the logistics, if you notice, and I'll tell you about this later on, they do not count numbers, but the day supply that we have. Operations, you have the medical task force, you have the triage task force and the personal task force. Three very important things. Medical takes care of patients. Triage, when the patients come in, they're classified as positive or negative. They're sent home or either admitted very important section and of course personnel takes care of our people there's us it's in the same order or level of importance as the medical and the triage and then the strike teams are sing single action strike teams the hemodialysis we have to still operate our hemodialysis for covid positives the subnational laboratory which is our covid lab and then of course ecmo uh, we will do everything for our patients ecmo being one of them and we already tried ECMO on a patient. Unfortunately, after two or three weeks, a patient did not survive. But we will not stop at anything to get these patients out of the hospital alive. 
Now, as I mentioned, we have a COVID response team. The staff services, you already mentioned this. We have no private clinics. We have no OPD service. We have no elective procedures. Sleep studies and the uh, sleep and the pulmonary function test, they're still being, not being operated now. On limited services, you have your oncoclinics, radiotherapy, and then the pulmonary, pulmonary therapy and the uh, ambulatory oncology. For the task forces, of course, our priorities would be personal safety. If you look at the top of the slide, the picture, incident command and objectives. Number one, personal safety. Number two, patient care. These things are not just being said. It is stamped on everything that we, we do in the decisions that we make. And okay, when we started, we, we labeled all the areas of the hospital. Red zone, very high risk. Orange zones, high risk. Yellow zone, medium risk. And the lower risk is the blue. Actually, the no risk is green, and there is no green zone at the lung center of the Philippines. I will show you what the, how these zones work. If it's a red zone, what is required? You should have full PPE, meaning to say cap, shield, mask, suit, gloves, and booties. This is for the COVID positive areas. Orange. Orange is a little difficult because you have COVID positives and negatives. You still don't know. They're waiting for the results. So full PPE with modification. What is the modification? You have to change your outer suit every time you enter one room. Meaning to say we have our full PPE suits. We put in a plastic cover or raincoat over it. Every time you leave a room, you remove your suit. You change your mask. You change your outer gloves because you have two gloves and then change your cap and change your, your shield, okay? And then yellow, these are the laboratories and the radiology areas, just mask. But if there is a COVID positive patient or a probable, everybody goes into full PPE. And then blue zone, you need mask. And then uh, that is for all the rest of the hospital. And then green zone, no mask, but we have no green zones. Now, to show you, this is the hospital entrance. When you enter, it's already blue zone. Actually, when you enter the grounds of lung center, at the gate, mask required. So it's already a blue zone. Mask is required, and there are reminders. If you look at the poster, blue zone, mask, and then there is a diagram showing cleaning of the hands. So always wear masks and perform frequent hand hygiene. You can see this all over the hospital. So we make no mistake, even if you're absent-minded, if you're forgetful, you, you're not in the good mood, you will know where, where you are in the hospital in terms of zoning. And on top of that, we segregated our medical and non-medical personnel. We designated an entrance for the non-medical. We designated pathways, staircases, and hallways for them so that they will not come in contact with our health personnel. And to make sure that they remember, there are pictures posted everywhere that if you're at this area, you should be seeing this picture, you should be using this staircase, you should be using this hallway, and this grand staircase up, upstairs, and then going up to the third floor, fourth floor, you should use this staircase. So we don't want them to be crossing each other, and we did this from day one. Uh, I think uh, not everybody is map is good with reading maps, so we decided to put pictures so they would realize or recognize where they are at the moment. This is what you see. If it's a blue zone, it says they always wear mask and perform frequent hygiene, and you have a map at the bottom. It designates where are the yellow, the oranges, the red, and the blues. Okay, I'll tell you about this later. That's why. Uh, if it's a red zone, there's a warning, it's a red zone. In all corners, in all walls, you will see this. And this is a layout, the floor plan of the lung center. G is the ground floor. If you can see, it looks like a T and then a diamond. Okay, in the diamond, the horizontal is yellow. That is the yellow zone, that is the diagnostics, uh, the radiology suite. But there are orange 
areas within the yellow, those are the CT scan and the, the CT scan streets. And if you can see some red spots, those are the laboratories and the pathways to patients who are COVID positive. And we have designated a separate, separate uh, elevator for COVID positives and personnel. Second floor, if you can see the second floor on the right up, all the rest are blue, but the horizontal, that's the operating room and the surgical ICU, they're yellow. And then the two, the, the, the letter V at the bottom, those are the COVID wards. I'll show them as you close up later on. And the third floor, the same, you have two diagonal wards which are red. And then the fourth floor are executive offices that is blue. So all you need is a mask for this. This, in, during our early days, this is how our triage looked like. Tents in the parking lot because we did not have the facility for triaging. Fortunately, we have an OPD building which has not been turned over yet and the department manager allowed us to use it. This is how it looks like now. We were fitting it out. This is how we started. We put in uh, concrete pathways and we put in a lot of ramps so there will not there won't be any interaction or when you're coming in it's a different way of going out it's a one-way flow of persons this is how it looks like when we were doing it you can see walls are being created now and we have the beds on the lower right with the oxygen tanks and then the waiting areas and the tent that you can see on the left picture is the waiting room for pay patients who are going for triage this is our triage area. It used to be supposed to be the OPD building. The one on the left is a red zone. It is where uh, patients are examined. You have your intubation zone there, you have x-rays there. And then on the right, you have the orange zone. Um, still full PP at this point in time. The yellow one on the right would be the laboratory of a separate laboratory in the, in the ER triage area. In the triage, you have separate donning and doffing areas. Um, very important. One, even in the separate triage, donning area and doffing area, there is a one-way flow. And if you see here in the doffing area, we have the, the yellow bags for the discarded PPEs. And just to make sure they do not forget the steps on how to, to remove things. You have to remove your gown and gloves together, disinfect your hands, remove your face shield, disinfect your hands, remove hair cap, and disinfect hands, and then you mask and disinfect hands. Always, always. And we drill this to them. Not only that, we have a poster everywhere on how to remove their full PPEs. Safety officer is very important. We have a safety officer and he can call our attention anytime. And there are three things that he does. He issues safety reports, incident reports, and near miss reports. Safety reports are action items. For example, he saw somebody walking or in the wrong zone or a person like me. I, I strayed into a wrong zone because I was fixing something. He will have to call my attention and, and then when it was done, the description, Dr. Ramos going into a wrong zone, priority, not very much because uh, it's not going to be a, a cause of mortality. I am the person responsible. And when am I supposed to correct it immediately? And I should be writing an incident report why it happened. And letter B incident reports, these are things which happened. Like, for example, we had a, an instance wherein we had an overflow of not overflow. We had too many bodies in our mortuary. It's an incident, uh, very important. So we had to investigate why and put the reasons how we can, why it happened. And so give the solutions, how it should uh, be, the procedure should be changed so it will not happen again. And of course, near miss reports. These are extubations, which were, fo which were found. Uh, because of this, we did some things. So these are the near-miss reports. Infrastructure modifications, very important. 
the problem with infrastructure modifications is we all have different architectural designs. And for Lang Center, it looked like a four clovers. So this is what we did. If we are going to convert our rooms into critical care rooms or IC rooms, we cannot have a, a watcher inside. We cannot have a nurse inside, especially for COVID positives. So what did we do? All rooms at the Lang Center of Philippines have CCTV monitors, each and every room. And the central monitor can be found in the nurse's station. That there be patient's monitor. We have 86 rooms. We have like about 60 rooms with patient's monitor, with telemetry, and you can see them. The central monitors are in the, lab, in the nurse's station. What's the importance of this? You can see actually the patient without being in the room. And if you see the patient a bit agitated, you can check with the cardiac monitor and the other vital signs monitor. And so you can, you can know immediately without being there, just like being in the IC where there's direct vision of each, of each patient. And then translucent doors, just like the IC, we can see through, we remove our wooden doors, we replace them with uh, thick plastics. And so we can, even if a patient is inside the room and the personnel is walking along the corridor, he can just glance inside and see what's happening to the patient. Letter D, air change per hour, very important. Our minimum is 12. Uh, you can compute this by getting the volume of your room times 12, and then you see the flow, airflow as, uh, as done by your exhaust fan. And then, so the total flow should be equal or more than 12 times the volume of your room. We have learned how to do this. And uh, fortunately for us, our ICC uh, is very strict. So when we were designing our, our airflow, even before this pandemic, uh, Dr. Galvez, I want I have to give her the credit for this, really was founding us on 12 ACH. So when this thing happened, we had 12 ACH in our rooms. Temporary walls. If you see in the picture on the right, we had no time to put in concrete walls or even uh, wooden walls. So we made use of thick plastic. We put in the frames, put in thick plastic, and put in a, a doorway so we can control the flow of air. And as I mentioned, letter F, donning and doffing airs, I'll show you this to you. Very separate donning and doffing airs. We learn from experience that they cannot be beside each other in a single flow of a one-way flow of personnel, donning and then doffing is on the other end. And then letter G, no crossing of non-health personnel and patients and health personnel, as I mentioned earlier. This is a typical setup, and I'll tell you, uh, these are two wards. The blue is the entry or the donning area. The personnel don, the PP is there, and they can do the rounds. But at the end, at the exit, they doff, and then they have to go out. When you go out, you want to come back. You cannot go back the same way. You have to go around and go through the entry again. And then you don again, and then you go around. It's a bit tedious, but I think it, uh, it lessens our contamination Initially, our entry and exit, donning and doffing, were just side by side. And when we looked at it, they were coming together. So it was not good. So we learned from the end users. They said, sir, let's put entry one end, exit on the other end. And lung center is fortunate. They have the architecture this way. The, the corridors are interconnected. We can afford to have one one-way flow of personnel. As I mentioned to you earlier, your plastic walls, uh, covering the hallways and you have labels on each zone. This is a red zone. Wear proper PPE because it's a, it's a red zone. This is a COVID ward. This is our donning area. You can see the, the, a donning area is actually a, a blue area, just the mask needed. But this is where they, they put on their PPEs, clean PPEs, they put on their booties and everything. You can see on the side, they're hanging their N95s. We've taken to preserving the number of uh, PPEs, including especially the N95s, because it's in very short supply right now. And we're looking at ways of doing UV sterilization and heat sterilization of the things that we do. This is how our COVID ward looks like. You can see abundant use of plastic to control the flow of air. 
And outside each room, you have your separate, segregated um, trash cans, and all the needs of the patients are in the in the table right outside the door, and of course a, a disinfect a disinfecting solution. So the nurse does not have to go back and forth. He can just get all the supplies right outside the door before he or she enters the ward. These are resupplied every after every shift, making sure that all these tables are are adequately supplied with the with the needed things of the of the nurses. This is our typical COVID ward. You can see the nurse is in full PPE gear, cap, shield, mask, PPE suit, double gloves, and booties. This is how the nurse station looks like, as I was mentioning earlier. Uh, we have wards which have like 10 patients monitor, some with six. It all depends on how much uh, the oxygen system can tolerate as far as supplying uh, ventilators are concerned. So, if you can see in this picture on the right, you have the monitor for the CCTVs and uh, side by side, we have the monitors for the patient's cardiac monitor. So we can see at all times, how the patient is doing, agitated, moving around, trying to extubate, calling for help, okay? Because if they're extubated, all they have to do is, you know, maybe wave their hands. If they're awake and they're supposed to be sedated, then we will know also. And it will be, it will be um, seen also at the, it will also be seen in the cardiac, patient's cardiac monitor. Did you see the keyboard? The keyboard on the left is covered in plastic. That's another innovation of the of our nurses. They change the plastics every so often because even if they're wearing gloves, they want to be extra careful. So this is how it looks like in a red zone. What do you see? This is warning red zone where proper PPE and the minimum required PPE is there: mask, shield, suit, cap, gloves and booties. So we know that our people are mindful, but we do not want to take any chances. At every time they turn, they will see what they need, need to be wearing. And additional patient care, are you protected? Overalls, if you need extra gloves, put in extra gloves. The reminders are always there. And aside from plastic, we use tarpaulin, for our medical ICU, we could not cover the whole hallway. It used to be a hallway, but to, to control the airflow, we placed double air tarpaulins as a temporary wall. Now this is the entrance to the ICU. We took this picture because on the right, you can see a HEPA filter. In case you cannot achieve the ideal ACH of 12, then having a HEPA filter would be very useful and I think it gives added protection. This is how it looks like in the ICU. Outside, outside is, a, is an orange zone. Inside, because there's a glass, in, intervening glass panel, you can see inside the nurse is in a red PPE that's inside the ICU. All the monitors are in the nurse's station. We brought out the nurse's station from inside the ICU outside and, and then we made use of the glass windows so from outside we can see inside there were two beds which we could not see and to make up for that we placed two extra CCTVs so that we can see those two beds on both sides which cannot be seen directly from the nurse's station this is how it looks like even our radiology department which is a a yellow zone it is uh, Although we minimize our exposure by putting up x-ray machines in the different areas. Now, the portable x-ray machines are more or less stationed permanently in the triage area, in the second floor. If they really need to go for CT scan, they controlled airflow. And of course, equipment. We can never overemphasize the need for ventilators. At the end of the day, 
what we count would be the number of ventilators because uh, in, the, in its worst form, it's respiratory failure and you can only serve patients as long as you have ventilators. So until now, we're still receiving uh, donations of ventilators. Why? Number one, we don't know how many patients would be needing them. Number two, nobody would come to you to repair your ventilators. And even if a repairman would come in, there are no spare parts to be bought now. So I think the, the thing to do is to really, really save up on ventilators, more important than patients monitor. So every time we have high flow oxygen machines and ventilators, we're so thankful. As I mentioned earlier, supplies are, men are measured in day supply. So the total number of units divided by the daily use, and that is your day, day supply. The most critical being PPEs. And of course, you, you need your sanitizing, disinfecting solution. But the PPEs are really number one. And we still are looking for more PPEs because as mentioned by Susie earlier, as she asked, how many do we use? 500 per day. And uh, we need to give our personnel the confidence of working because they know we will have adequate PPEs for them all the time, all the time. If you look at this, this is in a, an orange zone. Uh, these nurses have on top of their PPE suits, a plastic suit which they can remove when they leave a room which, in which the patient is not, uh, is not yet classified as positive or negative. This was a picture taken two weeks ago. We're fuller now. We have even more PPEs. Um, right now, we have four months supply at 500 PPEs per day. Of course, lastly, patient caring for our healthcare workers, shelter, food, transportation, and psychosocial issues. Um, fortunately, we have donors who are lending us or giving us vehicles which we can use to send, send our patients home, our, our personal home or fetch them. And of course, you have to provide shelter for them. In, 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 initially, if you look at the left lower picture, this used to be our AVR. But now we can use our AVR because outside, now we have our container van uh, dormitories donated. Uh, we can house 32 in these two structures, air conditioned, nice beds with the port portalets outside and shower areas. This is another type of LCP shelter we had, it was donation from the WTA group. Each structure can house 16 to 30, so we can house total of 60 individual cubicles with beds, there are showers, there are uh, toilet, baths, facilities, uh, there's Wi-Fi, it's air conditioned also. We can never overemphasize food. We'd like to thank the many donors who still support us right now because it's hard for us to, to provide food for all our employees. But right now we are doing that just so they do not have to go out and worry about their food. These are best record 30 days from last uh, COVID positive personnel, but sadly now it's back to zero. And we always, we always work for a, for a COVID free work, workplace. And we have also our task force personnel having uh, taken care, caring for the carers. We have, uh, we have an uh, day when we had the hair, uh, hair stylists, but, uh, and you can do your manicure, pedicure, is where I got my hair cut. You can see that the, the stylists are in PPE, but the personnel are not. They're protecting them from us. Um, it looked insurmountable at the beginning, but I saw this in a book. They say when you face a difficult task, you act as though it is impossible to fail. If you're going after Moby Dick, don't forget your tartar sauce. Now, what have we learned? Our last positives are engineering personnel. And when we did contact tracing, we learned that they got it from their homes. So while we were protecting our personnel inside the hospital, we were neglig 
we were, you know, we were neglecting them when they go home. So number one, we now have to do personal symptom monitoring. When they come in, we have to know what's their temperature. Do they have cough, sore throat, uh, difficulty breathing? And every day, this has to be filled up and reported by the safety officer in that office. Every day, we have lots of uh, non-contact thermometers. So this is a new thing, and this is how we were able to get our asymptomatic personnel who were positives. And because of this, we now have this stay safe at home reminders. We have a Tagalog version in the works. Reminders for them, and this is for them, and the next version will be for their relatives to change their clothes, avoid unnecessary stops on the way home, keep social circles small, avoid crowded places, perform hand hygiene often, always wear masks outside your house, often check for COVID symptoms. These are given and all employees are reminded about this. So when they go home, they will teach the relatives about this. And eventually we will have monitoring for their relatives at home, which they have to submit to us. So we will have some sort of control of their home uh, situation. So these are new posters, precautions during mealtime, and also how to remove and take off your mask. Precautions during mealtime, wash hands, schedule meals, as to minimize number, individual portions, no sharing, no talking while eating, no face-to-face -face during eating. We know that we have reminded them about this, but we know that they will forget we have to have a campaign of maintaining awareness, and this is part of it now. So this is posted everywhere at the Lung Center of the Philippines. You'd say, we already know how to remove or wear our masks. No, we have to put it one, two, three, four, five. Clean your hands before doing it. Clean your hands before removing or putting in your mask. Hold the mask by the ear loops and place a loop. We cannot trust everyone to be doing the right thing. So. We even teach them how to put on and remove their surgical masks. This is how important personal safety is for us. And we know that this is action research. Susie says it's common sense. I agree with her 100%. And uh, we take suggestions from everyone. End of the day, this is a photo by a good friend, Shara Sambrano. The best way to take care of our patients is to take care of our personnel. She is our angel in red. And we are so serious about taking care of her because our human resource is our number one resource. The bottom line is if you cannot protect your workers and they get sick, the whole system goes down. I'd like to thank again, the organizers of this for allowing us to share our practice. And hopefully I want to learn from the practice also of the other people participating. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, I think uh, that was a very inspiring, um, a very inspiring presentation indeed. There's a lot that we have learned from you and we'd like to pick up some of the questions of, uh, of of uh, the people who are in the webinar. I'll take off first a few, um, Raymond. So first question, uh, Tony, is uh, how often do you test your health workers? Okay, uh, we get baseline. Uh, we use uh, RT-PCR. And then as often as every two weeks, we do testing, especially for the front lines. Less frequently for those in the admin or in the backroom operations, but uh, every time they register something in the patient's monitor, they're tested immediately. And we're very fortunate to have the gene expert, so we have the result within the day. Okay. Uh, there's another question here before we go into our assessment of, of the webinar. Um, the question is, how do you do, how do you manage uh, airflow if you're in a centralized air-conditioned hospital? Very difficult. Uh, fortunately, our uh, 
number one, we did a review of our air handling units. We don't want sharing between clinical and non-clinical areas. So only clinical, the clinical areas, most of our air conditioning units are standalone. Our centralized air conditioning is in the is in the non-clinical or administrative air regions areas. Now, if you already have that uh, centralized air conditioning, I think you should look for other ways of uh, maintaining your ventilation. But in case you cannot do adequate HTH, they say HEPA filter is the best way to go. But I would be very wary, and I would even check the the direction of the air in your air handling unit is very important. You might be taking care of your patients, but you might be contaminating uh, in non non clinical area. And I'll give you an example. There was one hospital where we're also helping other hospitals. They keep on calling me. They get keep on getting positives. And I said, look at your air handling units. And true enough, a, a conference room was sharing because you know. Rooms are, our hospital was not, or were not designed for pandemics. It for usually, nagtitipid tayo. So sharing, di ba? So there was a clinical area where it was sharing an air handling unit with a non-clinical area. And we, we saw that and I told them, this is a no-no. Don't do this. So they had to stop uh, supplying to the clinical area and then put in window type or split type air conditioning units. Very yeah, good question. Yeah, because I think even when uh, th there's been some discussion around this, even in other countries, no? if you look at the, uh, the way the hospitals are designed in China or, or in the very developed countries, it's all highly centralized. You can't even open windows. And um, siguro it's a blessing on our part na we have old buildings where you actually have uh, compartments no? and uh, you can actually manage or re-engineer parts of the hospital. But this is a uh, part of the management of COVID that we will probably later on when we look back, you look at what's happening in the U.S., for example, many of these hospitals have highly centralized uh, air, airway systems and are not really meant for, for pandemics. Anyway, so I think Raymond wants to put in the assessment questions. You want to do that, Raymond, now? If I may, Dr. Just Dr. Susi. Yeah. Can I, can well, I say something? Go ahead, something? Dr. Ramos. Oh. Because the way they designed it is to save on money, on energy. A lot of our air is recirculated air. Right. That is why if you're going to design a building now, and Lung Center is designing a new wing, it's going to be totally different. It's going to be a building within a building. The non-health will have their own building inside the building. And then the, the health section will have a totally separate section. But you can see just one structure. Recirculated air is how, even in the States, because they want to save on energy, the, the, the heat is recirculated. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Ramos. Go ahead. Go ahead. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Susi. Um, so for as a tradition, po, we also ask our attendees to provide their answers po, to our, um, well, essentially an assessment of the webinar. So based on the questions, uh, so more than 80% of our attendees found that the presenter demonstrated thorough knowledge of the webinar topic and that he was well prepared and organized as well as spoke clearly and audibly. The presenter also showed that um, he was able to use appropriate language with technical medical jargons adequately explained and use appropriate uh, webinar techniques. So it's uh, overall it was very well received, Dr. Ramos, and uh, uh, it was very much appreciated po, all of the, um, the, the learnings po, and the experiences that people learned from uh, San Lazaro. Po. So for the questions, po, I think uh, I'll take over po muna from Dr. Susie in terms of the questions. Sir, sa San Lazaro po, uh, in terms of the reuse of the N95, parang ilang beses po kayo uh, pwedeng i-reuse? What do you do in, in, in between the reuse? Paano niyo po siya nililinis? Mga, mga ganun po, Does it, is it a centralized way o kanya-kanya po bang linis? Paano po ba yun, sir? Just for me. Yeah, well, well right now, we're, st we're, we're still developing the protocol for that. Um, we're looking at uh, UV light, uh, but they say 
in a, a certain temperature, 37 degrees, the virus will die in two hours. So we're looking at putting in, uh, uh, what do you call this, uh, heat, heat boxes. So we can put in uh, the, the, the N95 masks. And not only that, we realize that paper is a good form, Mike. Right? And uh, even the CIF, CIF forms. So we have, we're now designing boxes for each ward. So they can put in their masks. They can put in the papers, the patient's records. So when they transfer from one area to another, it is stamped, uh, what do you call this, disinfected. So I, we use heat and then we're going to put up a UV light uh, room so we can do more sterilization of uh, masks. Ayun. It doesn't really stop po pala dun sa, ano, no? sa actual PPEs. Kahit po yung mag ginagamit po sa hospital, like the CIF forms, they, they also yes, will yes. be that po. Yes. yes. It's a very good uh, uh, sharing po, uh, Dr. Tony. Next po, sir, uh, as part of, let's say, being an advocate for personal safety, ano po, uh, paano po ba yung pag-ratio po ninyo ng how many nurses can handle how many patients? Ganun po, the ratio, the health worker to patient ratio po ba? How, how did you arrive at assigning that? Ganun po. That's a very big challenge because uh, I'm sure there are nurses here. The level of care for the usual wards is 1 is to 4, 1 is to 5. If you go to ICU care, it's about 1 is to 3, sometimes 1 is to 2. So that's the reason why we had a call for nurses to come in because our regular beds are now critical care beds. So we need more nurses to maintain the 1 is to 3, 1 is to 4 uh, ratio of nurse to patients because we cannot toy around with that because if you still have one is to four and you have critical care beds, your nurses will get tired, they'll become careless, and if they're careless, they'll become sick. So we're still needing nurses right now, so we can do that, number one. Number two, so we can have rotation of nurses. If we do a computation, we need 200 more nurses, but I know that our budget cannot take it, so we try to be creative, as creative as we can, but we cannot rotate COVID to non-COVID. That is a very big challenge. We still maintain the, the, the nursing, critical care level of nursing, and we use the ratio that they have. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ramos. That was a very enlightening po. Ano po? Uh, the next question po, may, you may find it a little bit controversial in the sense po, sir, na parang um, with the, let's say, proliferation po ng rapid antibody test, although the DOH does not really recommend it, Marami po kasing gumagamit po ng gano'n, no, sir? So, how do you reconcile all of that that's happening po outside of the hospital, but also at the same time, we are using RT-PCR for the frontliners? Paano po, pagka may dumating po ba sa inyo na nag-RAT nag result as positive, how, how do you handle that, that sort of thing, sir? And how do you reconcile everything that's happening around LCP, sir? Basically, we don't use uh, antibody tests. Uh, the reason why we got antibody tests was to use for our convalescent plasma treatment. No? Uh, we don't even use it to, to screen people, yung antibody test. Uh, as, as Susie mentioned, I'm a thoracic surgeon. So I think the infectious people are a better way to answer it. But I can tell you, we don't use antibody tests because RT-PCR is the way to go. Uh, although it, it is not 100%, it's a lot better than antibody tests. So I'd like, no, I will not give my opinion regarding that because I'm not the authority. Tony, I have a question. No, because it seems from uh, we've heard several hospital presentations. Yours is really, really quite, uh, quite interesting in terms of um, engineering innovations, how you're using technology, how you're visualizing patients with CCTVs. But I'm, I'm really very intrigued by the safety officers because I think um, as we progress, uh, this is going to be increasingly important that you have people who are sort of like um, enforcers because it's very easy to forget. It. I think that the thing about this is behavior is very difficult to change. And even among the best of us, right, uh, it, it, it is always a challenge to remember that you have to do a certain thing. So 
do we have, I mean, how did you develop your safety officers? Do you have a training program for them? What are their qualifications? What do they do? Are they on shifts? How does that whole thing work? You'd be surprised. We have a young pathologist who we just assigned as a training officer. I just uh -huh. gave him one marching order. You can call our attention anytime for anything. And so he started going around based on the rules that we have on the zoning that he made. Violators are cited every day, including myself. And these are published. <laughs> and then to replicate himself, we, he assigned safety officers for individual units to make sure that the people in that unit are wearing the proper attire, PPE, uh, mask, they're washing their hands, um, distancing. So he is replicated. Training, there is no training, but I'm willing to share him. Uh, he can even give a, a, a seminar. Right. Yeah. 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 I can even, his name is Gerald Tejada. He's a fantastic guy. He's young. And, uh, hindi siya natatakot kahit sa akin. Sir, mali ka rin yun. Okay. Recite me. And I, I appreciate it. I know, keep everyone honest. The safety officer keeps everyone honest. Oh, I'll tell you. If the engineering people have to work in a ward, sabi ng nurse, please change the air conditioning unit because we don't repair anymore. The safety officer has to give the go ahead and say, yes, nalinis na yan, yes, na disinfect na yan, and then go ahead. We do not, it's not that we do not trust them. We do not depend on the nurses because we know that they want it done immediately. They say, They're okay na yan, you can go ahead and, and work. So the safety officer will have to vouch for it and say, yes, it was clean, yes, it was disinfected, go ahead and work. Yeah, but, it, Dr. For instances po na may violations, meron po bang sanction for that violation? Oh, wala pa naman kasi pag nagsusbende ko ng tao, wala, wala nang may iiwan eh. But uh, peer pressure, really, peer pressure is a lot. Nakakahiya ako, napahiya ako eh. So, so I remembered, no? Yeah, I, I think, Tony, this is really important moving into general quarantine, no? That uh, businesses, for example, could also have safety officers. And at yes. some point, you're saying that our health workers should be their health, their own safety officer at home. Yes, I agree, Susie, 100%. We should have a designated safety officer in each home, in each office. And the corporation, uh, in the CEO, CIO, and then you have a safety officer who, who will not be called by any manager. No, he's not answerable to the manager, but he's answerable to the CEO. But he can still cite the CEO for a violation. Very important. Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah, good, good, good. Okay, so we have some more questions, Raymond, on the... And I mean questions, of course, Tony. Yes, ma'am. You know, but I just want to tell everyone that um, what, we, what we typically do for the webinar is we send you the PowerPoint presentation. Is it all right to share your PowerPoint, Tony? Yep. Pwede okay. bang mabura lang yung aming figures sa whiteboard kasi nandun yung number of patients and everything? So, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay so yun lang. All, all the rest yeah. is fine. Okay, so Dr. Ramos will remove some of the slides and then we're going to be posting that on... Uh, we're going to send it to you for email. Pero, Tony, if you look at your chat box, salamat dito, no? I mean, I think uh, really there's a hunger for information about what to do to keep our health workers safe? Safe. Okay, uh, Raymond, there's some more questions you wanted to ask. I can yes, see po. so regards yeah. po sa zoning. So zoning po is regarded po as one of the more important factors to mitigate or prevent the wastage of PPE as released yeah. po do sa uh, DOH Department Memo 2020-0176. Sir, ang tanong po kasi nila, sir, so uh, uh, other hospitals only have three categories, red, yellow, green, so, so lang center po is uh, different naman po, no? So, ang tanong po is, uh, is that based on an international standard or is that something that LCP uh, came up with, with their own? And then also, in terms of, let's say, assuring our frontline workers po uh, who will need to go to parang specific zones, what is parang what is parang pong the the statement or assurance speech po to be able to alleviate their fears po dahil po they have to go to this or that uh, location sir 
Okay, nice question. Zoning, I think uh, Gerald was the one who thought about it, our safety officer. Because we just told him, you look, you segregate our areas based on what PPE they have to wear. So he came up with the zones. I don't know if he copied it somewhere, but this is what we're doing. Now, uh, what is the proof? There is no proof that it is effective except for the fact that we have a low number of healthcare personnel testing positive. Uh, aside from doing viral cultures, which we cannot do, uh, I think that is the only determinant or the measure that we can we can have for ourselves, huh? that we are doing the right thing. I think we're being overly careful and I'd like us to err on that side. So the zoning is, I've not seen it anywhere else, but I think we, we made it, but anybody's, Please feel free to copy it. It's it's free to for everyone to replicate. Okay, po. Thank you, Dr. Ramos. Um, so just to just for the benefit po rin po and to give Dr. Ramos a breather for the benefit for our participants. Uh, uh, please use the Q and A and the chat box for your questions, po. So we will not be using as tradition po the raise hand option to be able to. Uh, let's say, be able to live question our research speakers. But uh, nevertheless, uh, a lot of the questions po kasi get processed and get fielded po. And as, as part of our uh, tradition din po, we are sharing to our group that uh, we have a lot of um, attendees or registrants po from, not just from within the Philippines, and but also from the other countries. So, Dr. Ramos, International na po kayo, sir. Uh, in the Philippines po, uh, we, have, we have attendees from uh, the Rural Health Unit of Jaen, Nueva Ecija in Region 3, from Metro Health Specialist Hospital in Sorsogon City in uh, Sorsogon, Region 5, uh, from Amay Pakpak Medical Center in Marawi City, Dalgano del Sur. Yeah. Yes, sir. But for your international exposure, Dr. Tony, we have one from St. Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. From the Prince Sultan Military Medical Center uh, City, uh, from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and also Farwania Hospital in Kuwait. So, malabi po talaga, no, traditionally, uh, through the webinar series po na nag from other Middle East, parang ito po yata yung ating mga OFWs who are really interested in learning about the state of the art uh, for managing COVID-19, sir. So, thank you, po, for taking that time. And then for the questions, po, we have another one. Uh, would you recommend, po, na at, uh, even for level one hospitals, po, sir, that they have that it, it is mandatory. You make it mandatory for them to have a safety officer. And what would be, shall we say, the qualifications of that person, po? Yes, all hospitals should have a safety officer because there is no COVID free hospital. Qualifications, I think the number one qualification is commitment and passion. You can be a surgeon, you can be an internist, you can be an anesthesiologist to be a safety officer. In fact, you can be a nurse, you can be a med tech, as long as the passion is there and the commitment is there to keep on learning. Our safety officer, you know, I'm amazed. They, he keeps abreast of the, the latest pronouncements from WHO. And he's a pathologist. And, you know, my admiration grows every day. So every hospital, every organization, every business, every home should have a safety officer. Tama yung sinabi mo, Susie. Everyone should have a... And everybody should be a safety officer eventually. We should acquire the values of safety. Diba? Nobody should remind us anymore. If it is already ingrained, and then we all, then that is success as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Because we cannot make this virus go away. We can just protect ourselves. Yeah. I think as we move forward, Tony, you know, because we're looking, all looking at, quote unquote, the new normal, but the new normal is not something fixed. It's something that's always moving. So I think having a safety officer, designating that and having a culture or a system where that's acceptable to call out the manager of admin right, for going into the wrong place. This is a very important shift for us. Now, walang sinisino itong virus and therefore, 
yung safety measures natin wala ding sinisino. Tony, I have a question. Well, there are some more interesting questions here, but I have a uh, Another one, which is actually my question, and I was talking about this earlier with some colleagues that really I think one of the uh, one of the risky behaviors we have, whether it's in the hospital in or in the workplace, is going to be eating together. Because unlike the uh, Japanese and the Koreans who can sit, you know, somewhere and just eat and finish, Filipinos nagsasalo salo yan. No, parang if you're eating alone, there's something wrong with you, right? You have to be sitting, you have to be talking, you have to be sharing, nagtitikim-tikiman pa ng pagkain, no? Um, so I was very intrigued with your, with your, when you said that you had all these um, reminders about that. I wanted to know, how are you managing with that? Because that's going to be an issue in all workplaces, hospital or not hospital. It is a second nature that eating is a social behavior for us. So in the hospital, are people following that or do you have your safety officer putting in more citations because of it? Very difficult. Very difficult. Because as you mentioned, it's cultural. So right now, I tell you, lunchtime, if I go inside the different offices and I look at the pantries, I will see some violations, a lot of violations. So we're setting the stage for it. That's why initially we put up the posters knowing this is the stand of the safety committee. And then after that, when they know about it already, then we start moving and really checking. And then after that, if we find that there are problems, then as mentioned by Raymond, sanctions are going to be instituted. But that's going to be the last. We want to stay positive as far as these things are concerned. Because medyo demoralized na nga mga tao. So if you put sanctions, insult over injury. So we try to be positive about it. Uh, we put a positive spin on everything. Sabi ko nga sa'yo, ginawa na namin kanta ito. Eh. We, we made the song. We uploaded it on YouTube. Uh, it's called No Tats Plugging. Uh, N-O-T-A-T-S, No Tats. You search it, No Tats. Uh, TTJ Band. It's a group of mine in med school. And it's about not touching and washing your hands before touching anything and keeping social distance. Cultural, ang Pilipino, napaka-social na tao. Di ba? We keep, when we talk to each other, we even tap it, people on the shoulder. Eh, bawal na yun eh. Di ba? But we have to live with it and change our culture if we want to survive. Yeah. Okay, Raymond, there was another question here. Uh, Dr. Ramos, kung mag-asawa, husband and wife are doctors, uh, should they still be segregated at home? We are. We are. We are segregated at home. Uh, that's the sad thing. No? I see my wife and she waves goodbye. Pag malayo na yung sasakyan ko eh. Uh, and then she opens the door. She lets, I remove my outer clothes dun sa porch. And then I enter. I go straight. Nakabukas na yung pinto. I close the door take my shower, take my meals inside. And, uh, but buti na lang, there is Zoom and there is YouTube and there's Viber. That's the sad part of the story. But, you know, I cannot forgive myself if I bring it home. Yeah, okay. Some more questions, Raymond, on your part. So, for uh, this question naman po is about uh, the WHO recommendation of uh, not using, uh, it's, a, it's a coveralls versus gowns question po, Dr. Ramos. So, uh, based on the WHO recommendation, hindi po nila recommend yung coveralls kasi po uh, mas nagkakaroon po ng infection, lalo na po through doffing. So, is that something that LCP is also doing, sir? That uh, gowns lang po for routine care ang ginagamit? For COVID areas, coveralls. It's very hot. So, Okay, I'll tell you what we did. We put a maximum, four hours. Four hours, for, especially in our triage area. It's not air-conditioned. So if you're in the triage area, you're full PPE coveralls. After four hours, you're mandated to leave the area, doff, okay? There is an air-conditioned tent. You lie down, you sit down. I place, you place a table with the hot, hot water. You can have your coffee. There's a shower. You can take your shower. Then... We even have pull-up diapers for them. So after four, after resting, then they go back. But nothing more than four hours. We tell them, no, don't do it. 
It's not worth it. Because I've tried it. I put on a PPE inside an air-conditioned room. Only the younger guys can take it. I'm, I'm a senior citizen, so it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. We still use the coveralls, Raymond, because we want to protect them. Ayun. Okay po. Thank you, Dr. Tony. Um, and there is something po, sir, in light of the uh, IATF resolution, sir, no, and the recommendation to move into GCQ status starting on Monday. Uh, how does this translate in terms of, uh, shall we say, services po in LCP, sir? Does this mean that you will start uh, taking in elective surgeries po ba or elective cases? Uh, is that, uh, how, how, how is LCP, Lam Center of the Philippines, preparing po? for this shift in quarantine, sir? I think Lang Center will always be two weeks late. We, are, we already did planning for OPD, return of other services, even surgery. We were discussing it this morning. But when we're going to trigger it, I think we're going to be late because if there's an increase in the number, we will have to, we'll have to you know, uh, defer, defer that one. And uh, just between you and me, we targeted maybe the first week of June as an increase in the number because of the May 16 uh, modified ECQ. And then now it's a June 1, June 1 GCQ. It's a, an increase on top of an increase. So even if some wards are not filled up, we're not giving it back to the non-COVID non -COVID areas because we want to be sure that we will not need them anymore. And because of this GCQ, our sense of awareness and and the uh, alarm is heightened. It's not relaxed. It's even heightened. Okay. Dr. Susie, do you have any questions, Paul? Um, there's another question here. Let me just read it. It's from Rem. I recently participated in a webinar. Uh, what was it saying here? Oh, this was answered already. All right. This, I'm sorry. This was answered already. So there's another question here. Okay, are you planning to do RT-PCR for elective surgery when you start? I, I think we'll need to do that. Uh, DNA expert is the nice way to do it because you can get it in an hour. Um, I think that's, and I think the government is very fortunate to have a lot of DNA expert machines, if, if I'm correct, uh, because it gives you that flexibility to test the patient if it's negative and go for elective surgeries. I think that's the way to go. Okay, so it's going to be gene expert. So there's another question here. If a patient, or sorry, if staff are, if a staff member, a healthcare worker is diagnosed as positive, but asymptomatic, when do you ask them to return? We ask them to go in quarantine, either here in the hospital or at home, if we can verify that it's, they have a good quarantine facility at home. We test them after 10, 14 days. If they're negative, we do another test where we work on the conservative side. We know that the WHO says about 10 days and single test, but we still do two negatives before they're allowed to go back to work. And from their last negative, quarantine for 14 days. Wow. And uh, wow. We, can, we can accommodate them here because it would be so unfortunate if we're, you know, if we are taking care of them from the side of the patient and then we're getting hit, we call it a hit. We get hit from our own, from our own personnel. We don't like that to happen. Right. Okay. So I think, uh, I think Raymond, we're good. We've, we've, we've covered most of the questions. Okay. Uh, Just one more question, Dr. Susie. Uh, the question po kasi is about understaffing. So obviously, because of the preparations that you have had at LCP, uh, Dr. Tony, uh, it's very, it's very, it has been very impressive and it has been able to, let's say, prevent parang sobrang overburdening and overwhelming of the system. But also, you really have not reached yung pong talagang totoong understaffing. But obviously, you have had uh, certain plans in mind or strategies in mind po kung dumating po na, let's say, more than 50% or 60% of the staff become uh, COVID positive po, sir. So, would you mind sharing, sir, na... What were, what were the, the proposals or the plans of LCP uh, in case na umabot po kayo doon sa, uh, do, do sa understaffing because of uh, na marami na pong na-infect? Search plan, you mean? Um, 
Number one, we're very fortunate that we have a lot of doctors who volunteered to come in. Like we have, if I'm not mistaken, 25 contractual wow. doctors. And I'm not talking about just new graduates. These are consultants already in, in big hospitals. I was so surprised they came in. I said, why, why, why are you doing this? You're forsaking your practice. I said, we want to be where it is. And this is where it is, they say. So we want to be where the action is. And when we give them a tour of our facilities, and I include the, the warehouse for PPEs, then they say, we really stay because you know you're going to protect us. Now, we have a surge plan, but we have to know that it will only be up to as many ventilators as we have. For example, right, we started with 27. We have now 64 ventilators. After 64, we're, that's it. So we hope that the numbers don't go up. We have maximized the surge plan. We have maximized it already. It's just a matter of opening the, the, the rooms now, but it's there already. And uh, right now we have, uh, there are numbers, I think we have 22 vacancies. So we're still good. We yeah. hope the numbers don't go up, please. We're praying every day. Okay, so thank you very much, Tony. Uh, uh, Raymond, do you want to answer the questions in the quiz? Oh, yes. Um, I think it's time that we answer the questions and ask Dr. Ramos. So uh, maybe we could get that up on the screen right now. Ayun po. Wow. So, ano po ba mas importante, Dr. Ramos? I mean, definitively the answer, patient care or personal safety? Para lang po marinig po namin from you, sir. Of course, personal safety. Pero dapat hindi lip service ito. It should be evident in the policies and guidelines of the hospital. It should not be something that is placed on the wall. It should be something in the minds of all the leaders, managers, and even our personnel. If there's a choice between a patient, I'm sorry, if there is a choice between patient care and personal safety, I'd go for personal safety because without personnel, no patient care. Like the policy, no PPE, no CPR. Incomplete PPE, no CPR. Patient may die. Well, that's it. But I want to preserve our personnel because that's the number one resource is the human resource. I cannot get it from anywhere else. Okay. Now, does personal safety end when you leave the hospital? No. And that is why I agree with Susie. We should all have safety officers in all hospitals, all departments, all units, all homes, all businesses. Should have a safety officer. So personal safety will be taken care of all the time. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tony. Uh, any parting words or uh, concluding remarks, Dr. Susie Po? Okay, well, uh, Tony, thank you lang. Thank you, I think, on behalf of everyone who's listening, on behalf of the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation. I think um, your, your point about... Uh, personal safety comes above everything else is a very strong uh, position that we all need to take because, uh, you know, we have no use for dead healthcare workers. We have to have healthcare workers who are safe, who are happy, who are productive. And before we close, uh, your parting words, Tony. Yeah, I, I don't want any more dead healthcare workers. In fact, Hindi pa natin na pagluluksa yung mga namatay natin kay Vigan. No more of those, please. So please, take care of your personnel. Take care of your families. And pray to God that we get the vaccine soon because, you know, we're doing our best. But uh, I think you have to pray so God will help us along the way. Thank you very much, Raymond. Thank you. Thank you, Susie, for putting me up to this. And uh, I wish that the other people will share also their practices because I want to learn also. I want to learn from them. Thank you very much. And everyone, please stay safe. Okay, so a uh, very um, inspiring... Naiyak na ako sa iyo, Tony. When I see on TV, naiyak na rin ako eh. Siko parang, well, you know, it's a difficult time for everyone. But I think we draw strength from what you're doing in the Lung Center that you get up every day you do what you need to do and to hear that there are so many frontliners like you who are not going to give up and you're going to fight and you're going to protect all the health workers 
that is a bright moment for our country. And we are just grateful for all that you're doing. And thank you for your time. We know you're busy. Thank you for your time. So on behalf of um, the whole group, uh, the UP team, uh, the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation, and all of those who are listening uh, on this webinar, maraming salamat po sa inyo. Uh, stay safe and we'll see you next Friday. So next Friday, we're going to have uh, a cardiologist, Chito Permejo, from the Heart Center, who's going to talk about COVID and the heart. We know that uh, heart disease is a huge risk factor for individuals who get COVID. So please be with us again next Friday. Let's make that our Friday habit to be on the clinical updates, stop COVID deaths, clinical updates of UP and PhilHealth. Over to you, Raymond. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tony. Very inspiring, Paul, as uh, Dr. Susie Mercado said. Uh, just a takeaway, Paul, no, for, for those who are still with our broadcast, that safety is always paramount. And it all, you have to have that top of mind, whether you are in the hospital, in your businesses, and especially in your homes where you are likely to maybe expose them uh, potentially to your loved ones and family members. So maraming salamat po ulit, uh, Dr. Tony Ramos and Dr. Susie Mercado. At magsama-sama po ulit tayo uh, next week. Uh, hopefully, we will be able to have more participants because for this webinar po, we had at our peak more than 250 participants. Wow. Salamat po for uh, spending your lunch time and your lunch hour po with us. And hopefully, marami po kayong uh, nakuha, natutunan, and you will be able to apply that uh, in real life. So maraming salamat po. Next week will be our seventh webinar, and it will be on cardiology and the effects of uh, COVID-19 on the heart and the circulatory system. So on behalf of the University of the Philippines and the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation, magsama-sama po ulit tayo next week. Maraming salamat po. Keep safe, keep healthy, and see you online. Thank you.